How are there folks? Welcome into today's video. So I thought that since it's the weekend, um, let me take you guys in depth on a ton of numbers in metrics. Uh, margin debt is collapsing right in front of us right now. I got a ton of stuff to show you guys. I, you know, sometimes on the weekend, I love to just go through some of this information on kind of where the market's trading at, what's going on with um, the market a little deeper. And um, I also I kind of spend some time listening to some conference calls and things like that on the weekend. You can just kind of like catch up on everything that's going on out there. So yeah, a bunch of stuff to show you guys in today's video hope you enjoy it hope you get some good value out of this and and uh some pretty shocking stuff i'll show you in today's video this is definitely uh for sure if you're bullish or bearish on the market i got some uh, information for you so appreciate you guys thanks for being here thanks for being subscribed if you're looking to apply to join my private stock group my private wealth group that'll be in the description area to fill out an application down there Alrighty, so right off the bat here these are the latest margin debt numbers we have out here as of march uh, we are at about 645 billion dollars roughly now if you you know you, you see a number like that you like is that really high for margin debt is that really low uh, at peak we were over 900 billion dollars okay um uh, as far as you know if you look at past periods i mean this is a similar number that we had in december of 2017 for instance which obviously was a, a long time ago now at this point in time right and so it just goes to show you there's really no appetite for taking out margin to buy stocks right now I think there's two core reasons, to be honest, okay? The first reason is the most obvious one, which is right now, if you're going to take out margin debt to buy stocks, you're going to pay very high rates, very high rates. I mean, I, I'm, if you were to buy margin, if you were to buy stocks on margin right now, I think the average person would be looking at a 10% plus rate right now. If you could get a really, really good low rate, you might be a 7 or 8% right now for margin. That's not very attractive. I mean, I can understand, you know, margin's always a very big risk, right? But I can understand if margin's at 2%, 3%, you know, people being incentivized because they're like, well, all I need to do is, you know, get 7% or 8% and gosh, I make a big profit on that. But right now, guys, I can just tell you, like a lot of people are not even looking for that. The second component of this is like, why are people not wanting to take out margin right now? I think is because of worries around the market right now, because of, you know, lack of confidence in kind of where stocks are headed. So when you, when you have one of those time periods, there's not a lot of folks that are looking to do margin. Now, keep in mind, there's always going to be a certain amount of people that are out there doing margin. That's always the market. You're going to look at 2008, 2009, 2010, 11, every single year. There's always going to be, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars out there in margin outstanding. And do keep in mind as the market goes up over the coming years, right, over the next 10, 20, 30 years, the amount of money on margin will continue to go up over time. It's just a natural occurrence in the market, okay? So I thought that was pretty intriguing. Now, to take a peek here, look at S&P 600 small caps, uh, 4P ratios. We're trading very, very low low still at this point in time. Now, are we as low as we were last year at some points in time? No, but we're still very low. And so it shows you this is where the true opportunities still are in this market, S&P 600 small caps. And, you know, if I think about most of the stocks I've been buying recently, you know, most of them are under $5 billion market caps. There's some opportunities that are bigger, right? I think about Amazon. Amazon's been kind of my number one stock I've been buying, you know, over the past six months or so. But this is where the, you know, you just have an immense amount of opportunities in S&P 600 small caps now at this point in time. This goes all the way back to 1999. And I mean, you can really only find us lower um, other than recently, right? You can only find us lower in March of 2020. And then the great financial crisis. And that's it. That's it for the past 25 years, roughly. Okay. So nonetheless, folks, that's where true opportunities are in this market. Mid caps, definitely still an opportunity in this market. Obviously, we were considerably lower in the great financial crisis. We got all the way down to eight, nine range in terms of uh, your forward P ratios for mid caps. Right now, we're at 13 and a half. Uh, March of 2020, uh, we got a slight bit lower in the December 2018 crash there right? Uh, the double dip recession fears here around 2011, we got slightly lower as well. But mid caps, you're going to definitely find a lot of opportunities in mid cap land in this market. Large caps, not a lot of opportunities, unfortunately, folks. Um, trading at 18.2 right now. Yeah, it's it's significantly down from where we were at back at the end of 2020, 2021. That's great. Okay, making some progress there. But the bottom line is, folks, uh, large caps are still not the opportunity. I mean, just look at the past 25 years or so. And uh, yeah, it's 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 not up here like we were in 99. Yeah, it's not where we were, you know, in the 2021, 2020 bubble. But we're still we're still high, man, when it comes to large caps. And so do keep that in mind. You're going to find much better opportunities in this market in mids and small cap stocks. Okay, next up here. 
This goes to show you the Russell 2000 versus uh, SP 600 small caps as far as where they're trading at for P ratio wise. The Russell is, is you know, you've got opportunities in the Russell, but the interesting thing about the Russell is you've got a lot of stocks in there that aren't profitable or could be stocks that um, maybe have small profits, uh, you know, like m companies that are just getting to profitability. So it holds back kind of the forward P ratio and it makes it look much worse than it is. But uh, small caps, as far as SP 600, that's where you're really getting opportunities at 12.9 roughly or so. And, you know, when you see something like that and you're like, oh, there's got to be opportunities there, but I don't know what stocks are. Okay. Google is your friend. Okay. Literally, you can just Google S&P 600 small caps. Uh, Markets Business Insider has it. And you can go through a list. You know, you can spend a few hours on this list of S&P 600 small caps, right? That's where the real opportunities are in this market. And you can go through these companies. You can click on them. You can search them. Like uh, A.O. Smith, what do they do for their business model? Ah, that seems confusing. I don't really want to look into that. Uh, Advanced Energy Industries. Let me look into that. Ah, uh, I don't really like what they do. I'm a little confused. I, I don't want to look into that one. You can go down the list, man, and find companies where the true opportunities are in this market, okay? Next up here, we're looking at peg ratios. Now, this is one of the most confusing things um, you're going to find ever in the stock market because this is price to earnings growth. Now, if you think about this logically, if you know you have to pay a high peg ratio, that's usually not a good thing for stocks. And you know, usually if a peg ratio is high, like uh, just anybody that has a brain would think that's not a good. I shouldn't be buying stocks. But the fact is, when peg ratio is actually really high. It's always a phenomenal time to buy stocks over the past 20 years. If we just look over the past 20 years, every time peg ratio got high, it was actually ended up being a great time to be a buyer of stocks, which is so counterintuitive to what you think, right? Look at this. This is around 03, 04. It was a great time to be a buyer of stocks. Great time. And look at how high the peg ratio was. Look at 2009. Look at how high peg ratio was in 2009. Oh my gosh, it was the best opportunity to buy stocks since the Great Depression. Absolutely amazing time, right? It, like, how does that make any sense, right? You look back at this time period. This was around 2015, 2016. Great time to be a buyer of stocks. Look at how high peg ratio was. You look at March of 2020. Look at where peg ratio went, right? This is around April, March, April 2020. Great time to be a buyer of stocks. And right now, you know, I don't know. We'll see. Obviously, you know, we'll see how things trend over the next few years. Maybe this is different, but it's a very confusing thing because it goes against everything you'd think logically. Like peg ratio high means bad. I shouldn't be buying stocks, but dang, should have been, should have been, should have been, should have been. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. So, you know, and to take that a little deeper, if you think about it, usually in time periods, you know, of let's call it recessions or things like that, like, you know, usually just growth is going to be slower. And so usually you're going to have to have a, a higher peg ratio. Now, trailing PE, if I, you know, this is really relevant for the 90s on, in my opinion, you know, looking back at what the market was trading at in the 30s and 40s and 50s doesn't do us any good. Everything's so much different than now the business models, the economic system, uh, the way we run money, being off the gold standard, like it's a whole, it's night and day difference, okay? Now, trailing peas, if we look at since the 90s, there's definitely some periods where we we're trading lower than this, you know? There's definitely some periods where we we're trading, obviously, extremely elevated versus this on a trailing P basis. So, you know, when I look at something like this, I say the market is trading roughly in line with, with what I would expect in a normal market. I can't say on a trailing P basis, the market's super undervalued or overvalued right now. I think we're about where we should be. Alrighty, folks, had to move this party in the garage because that sun was hitting my computer. Those fans were spinning. I thought this whole thing was gonna go boom. All right, next one up here. So now we're looking at Ford P's growth versus value. S&P uh, 500, Ford P's uh, growth versus value. Now, in terms of growth, you know, it, it depends on what your time frame is. If you're going to look back at kind of, let's call it the 05 through about 2015 time frame, that 10-year span or so, you know, not getting great deals on growth stocks, obviously, out there, right? But if you look at more recent history, it looks like a smoking deal. So it really depends on what you're going for in terms of kind of growth, right? Value stock's pretty in line with where we've been in the past. Obviously, here you're at 10, 11, 12. But the thing to remember, uh, when you look back at these time periods, whether it's 2009, 2010, 2012, you know, 2011, like those sorts of years, 
they just understand there was an unrealistically low market at that given time, right? And to hope, you know, we're going back there, it's always a possibility, and I welcome that, but it's just um, not super realistic. I think it's much better to look at time periods like 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 to kind of get you in, in realistic ranges for where the market should trade at at a given time, okay? Now, next one up here, this is really intriguing. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this one before, okay? S&P 500 forward P's percentage of companies above 20 uh, forward P, or excuse me, current P, and uh, below 10. Now, this is intriguing, right? So the red line here, this is a, a percent of companies that are above a 20 P. And the blue line is percent of companies below a 10 P. Okay, so it just basically shows you how many stocks are valued really high at a particular time or really low, right? And if you look at this chart over the past almost 20 years here, you can find that almost every single time these two metrics will, will have this extreme kind of, um, let's just call it separation, all right? And then over a few years, next thing you know, they end up converging, converging again, okay? Then they'll be together, then they separate in a massive way again, and then they end up converging, right? Separate, converge, separate, and look at, we have a slight conversion here, and maybe this ends up, you know, connecting all the way uh, sometime soon here. So it's really fascinating to kind of see this, and uh, we're definitely going through a time period where these are converging more and more and more. Now, if you look back at time periods in the past, you know, when you get it kind of that, conversion area, I mean, honestly, it usually looks like a pretty tremendous buying opportunity when these actually get really, really close together. So obviously, we were really, really close kind of 08, 09 there for a bit, right? In that kind of time period, obviously, it was tremendous buying opportunity in those years coming out, tremendous buying opportunity. Then if you look, uh, obviously, right here, which was the very end of 2018, that was a tremendous buying opportunity. This was March, April of 2020. Tremendous buying opportunity there, right? And then recently, as these have gotten closer and closer, in my opinion, the market's become much, much better value, right? You're getting good bang for your buck out there in the market. And so that's just something interesting. When these two separate, traditionally, it's actually not a great time to be a buyer of stocks. I mean, you look, obviously, this is right prior to the great financial crisis, not, obviously not a great time to be a buyer of stocks. If you look right here, this was prior to the bear market we had in 2018, right? When this massive separation happened and then obviously the market trended really, really low and uh, things got really ugly in December 2018. You know, this is kind of like a one-off situation, so you can't say too much about that, right? And then this is at the very end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021. Obviously, you know, there just was no deals in the market anywhere. And, you know, it wasn't a good time to be a buyer of stocks when this had this massive separation. But then recently, since these numbers have gotten much closer, you've gotten much better values in the, in the market, right? So I think that's intriguing as well. Just one of those random charts to kind of keep an eye on to see, you know, how many stocks are really trading overvalued or undervalued at a particular time. Next one up here, this is S&P 500 price to sales ratio. We're trading still high for forward price to sales ratio. We're at 2.13 right now. Now, we should usually, usually you can get a good deal if you're around a 1.5, okay, as far as a price to sales ratio. Right now, 2.13, not a tremendous buying opportunity, but do remember companies nowadays are much more profitable than they've been in those called past generations of companies. You know, if you think about the companies today, like their profitability is so astronomically high compared to past companies, like how much of their revenue actually hits the bottom line, because a lot of these companies are tech related, software related. Um, you know, they don't need huge employee forces like past companies did. And so that is just something to keep in mind there. So it doesn't work perfectly. Now, obviously, we're not at nearly a three like we were at one point in time. So that's good news, right? But do keep in mind, it's more of a comforting feeling if you can get under two. And if you can get under 175 and get close to a 1.5, that's really tremendous. Now, there's time periods where you can get even down to a one-ish, but that you need an extraordinary crash to happen to get down to like a one, one, two, five, something like that. Like we saw obviously 08, 09, 2010 there, okay? Now, this is something I saw on Twitter here today. Somebody posted this, Jeremy Grant and Warren's US uh, uh, house prices are going to drop. Obviously, SP 500 could plunge 50%. More banking problems ahead and things like that, right? And Jeremy Grantham's kind of always out there. And I, I saw this. This was uh, kind of funny. Predicted 15 out of the last two recessions. And, you know, Jeremy Grantham, I, I definitely, you know, I think he's very intelligent. But at the same time, the, the issue is 
with a lot of these folks that they, they kind of fall into almost like the perma bear category and they're only kind of the value stock. And so they got just different mentalities, man. They got different mentalities to, you know, it's a different time and age, right? And these folks, they can't, they can't get wrap their heads around a stock that trades over a 20 PE. And the fact is like for growth stocks, it's unrealistic for these stocks to trade at a 20 P 15 P like Tesla's not going to trade at that. Amazon's not going to trade at that. Nvidia is not going to trade at that. Right. They're always going to trade exponentially more than that because those companies have massive growth over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So to tr expect them to trade at these low PEs. And so when they, these stocks aren't trading at that, the, these guys get frustrated time and time again. And I've watched them for 15 years now. And they say, this is a bubble. This can't happen. This and this and this. And it's like, you're not going to get your scenario to play out where all these stocks that you, know, you want to be at this sort of valuation, they're not going to trade there. Like, I hate to break the news to them, but it's not going to happen, right? And so that's just something to kind of keep in mind there. And obviously, a lot of those guys don't like it when the Fed's pumping money out there. But then when the Fed's not pumping money out there, right, then they all of a sudden are saying the market's going to, you know, crash 50%. And so it's like, well, what do you want? Like, do you want the Fed to, to work against the market? Do you want them to work for the market? Like, what do you really want in these different scenarios, right? So I don't know, man. You know, I just think that's the approach for a lot of the, these sorts of folks uh, in the end, okay? Now, this was interesting. Uh, I saw this from a Twitter account. Lyft's new CEO started a week ago. He just laid off 1,200 people, about 30% of the company. The company lost $1.6 billion in 2022, $1.1 billion in 2021. Stocks down 86% since Lyft went public in 2019. You know, this is something we're seeing play out in corporate America, especially in the tech world. And painful stuff to go through in the short term, but I can tell you this is all going to be this is going to set us up for a prosperous, you know, 10, 10 year run again. And if you look at the great financial crisis, there was a lot of things that happened. It was obviously a deleveraging of, uh, you know, uh, consumers balance sheets, a lot of companies balance sheets, a lot of companies either going bankrupt or getting to a better level, right? Getting out of a lot of the froth in the system, companies leaning up their organizations. And that set us up for a decade runway of great growth, right? Great profit growth, great growth in the stock market, right? Great growth in the stock market. And um, that was all phenomenal. And so we see a very similar phenomenon going on out there right now, where you see companies like Meta doing massive cuts, right? Amazon doing massive cuts. I mean, we could go through almost every single big tech company out there is doing these massive cuts. Smaller companies like Lyft, because at the end of the day, for these companies to lose billions of dollars, right? Or just be bloated with their employee forces and doing jobs that is not even necessary, right? We've heard the stories recently about meta employees that are making hundreds something thousand a year, six figures a year, doing nothing, literally nothing. That comes from the employee's mouth. Not coming from random other people. This comes from the employee's mouth. Like, oh yeah, I wasn't doing anything. I worked there for six months and you know, I made uh, you know, $190,000 a year, did nothing. Like it's ridiculous. And so these companies are leaning out and they're setting themselves up for a prosperous next decade. And I can tell you, it's going to be healthy for the market overall. It's, it hurts short term, but I can tell you it's going to be way healthier for us for the next 10 years when you go through one of these time periods. This I thought was interesting also from the same account. Uh, breaking Fox Business reports a large investors are worried about systemic risk in private equity. Blackstone Apollo could be over leveraged on deals that they did at inflated valuations. <laughs> like that to me is like, no duh. You know what I mean? Like, 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 are they just figuring that out now? The thing, private equity has been able to get away with this because the stock market was doing very well for a long time. So they could keep their kind of Ponzi-ish, let's call it thing going, right? Keep the Ponzi going because they could essentially take these companies public and then the public investors would buy them off them. Well, you know, I... I don't know if you guys have seen, but no companies are going public now at this point in time. Like no companies are going public, okay? And last thing I saw was interesting here is the housing market obviously still down in a, in a pretty epic way. I don't see this fixing. I don't see this fixing anytime soon. This is gonna continue to be this way uh, for this year. And you know, next year we have a chance, Fed lowers rates, uh, they get in a healthier place, maybe something happens there, but for now folks, yeah. Not, not a pretty situation, okay? Alrighty, hope you guys enjoyed today's video. As always, appreciate y'all. If you're looking to apply to join my private stock group, private wealth group, that will be in the description area down there. Hope you guys got some good value out of this video, taking you through all these massive amount of charts. Much love and have a great day.